Black Panther comes out in theaters this month, and you know, last month I did talk about black representation in comics in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but I thought the Black Panther is a great time to look at how this one character was introduced in the 60s and turned black representation in comics on its ear. Although I pointed out last month that the Silver Age's first black hero was Dell's cowboy star Lobo, it was Fantastic Four number 52 in 1966 and the introduction of the Black Panther that finally broke the color barrier in comics. I mean, for the characters in the pages of the comics, as for black creators, that's... That's going to take a little while longer. Although he was predated by a couple of years by Gabe Jones, a member of Nick Fury's Howling Commandos, the Black Panther was Marvel's first black superhero. T'Challa didn't simply break the mold of black characters as servants. He was the king, and not of a primitive, uneducated society, but a nation that was technologically advanced beyond the world outside. The Black Panther had authority and intelligence, and while he had some of the trappings of African stereotypes, he was also many steps ahead of the tribesmen that were given in decades of comics before that. Marvel was the groundbreaker in this field. Shortly after the Black Panther, we met Sam Wilson in the pages of Captain America, who quickly became the Falcon, and for several years shared the title with Cap. Falcon was introduced as a reformed criminal, but eventually became a social worker, someone making positive changes within his fictional world, just as his very introduction was making changes in the world of comics itself. But in this world of superheroes, I think the character who gets lost is Joe Robbie Robertson, a Spider-Man supporting character who was introduced as the city editor of the Daily Bugle in 1967, a black character who was introduced as Spider-Man's boss, and whose race was rarely commented on. In an era when the battle for civil rights was in full swing, here was Robbie just being a character making a bigger statement than many simply by not trying to hammer a statement. The 70s would introduce several black characters both in supporting roles and in their own titles, and many of these, like Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, later Power Man, and later Luke Cage again, were obviously influenced by the black exploitation movie craze of the time. Others, like Urban Archie knockoff Fast Willie Jackson, were obviously trying to cater to a black audience. Even though they played on stereotypes, they were appealing to the cultural dynamics of the time. Jabbar, what are you protesting for with a blank sign? I'll let you know, Willie, after I check out today's news. Not all of Marvel's black characters from the 70s were steeped in urban culture, though. From British vampire slayer Blade to African thief-turned-goddess Storm, Marvel was giving us a variety of great characters. DC, I love you guys, but... Uh, sure, there were solid characters like Jon Stewart, who briefly became Green Lantern in Hal Jordan's absence and continues to this day as an excellent character. Wonder Woman's fellow Amazon Nubia, whose name was a little on the nose, was a strong heroine whose legacy lives on, and non-superheroic teams like The Secret Six and Easy Company had black members. But DC's attempts to be socially relevant were sometimes questionable, and often a bit heavy-handed. It's important that I live the next 24 hours as a black woman. I've been reading about you. How you work for the blue skins. And how on a planet someplace you helped out the orange skins. And you done considerable for the purple skins. Only their skins you never bothered with. The black skins. I want to know how come. He wasn't just directing that at me. It was a slam against all blacks. Okay, DC weren't quite on the same page as Marvel. But still, they were making efforts. Uh, but I've got a story to tell you. Despite having characters with orange skin and blue skin, oh good lord, that Green Lantern quote was right. Popular team book The Legion of Superheroes featured no humans of anything but Caucasian ethnicity despite being set in a 20th century allegedly free of 20th century prejudice. When artist Mike Grell decided to draw a side character as African American, the character was colored Caucasian anyway, and the editors assured him that the absence of black people in the Legion's future was a plot point they were going to address. And that addressment was Tyrock, the hero of a planet where all the black people on Earth fled to generations before, and which exists mainly in another dimension rarely accessible by the rest of the universe. The solution to segregation was extra-dimensional segregation, and the Legion's first black character was a pro-segregationist several years after segregation was an acceptable practice in the U.S. Mike Grell hated Tyrock, as can be seen by this costume he put him in. And really, even after years of trying to redeem the character, he's still tainted by this unfortunate origin. On the other hand, 
If it weren't for the so-called DC implosion, in which DC canceled several ongoing and upcoming titles due to financial difficulties, they would have been the very first publisher with a superhero title headed by a black female, Vixen. And they also, shortly after the Tyrock fiasco, introduced Black Lightning, Jefferson Pierce, school teacher and social activist, who I should have, you know, probably mentioned at least once last month when I was using his TV show as a jumping off point. And along with Cyborg and Bumblebee and the Bronze Tiger, by the 80s, DC actually had a good selection of African American characters. And if there was any doubt, they also published and distributed and eventually purchased Milestone Comics, a line of superhero titles featuring entirely people of color, such as the powerful Icon and his probably more significant sidekick Rocket, power armored wearing inventor Hardware, and the breakout star Static, who has become a major fixture in DC's landscape. By the 90s, both the big two had several popular black characters in major roles, like Marvel's War Machine or DC's Steel, both of them started out as the black version of popular white heroes, but each of them came into their own identity after a while. And over at Image Comics, they practically launched the line with a black hero spawn. Today, while far from perfect, there's more representation than there's ever been. It may be an industry that's still dominated by a few big-name white guys, but it's come a really long way from Steamboat and Whitewash Jones. And with Black Panther coming out in theaters, a mainstream superhero movie with a primarily black cast, I think we're heading in the right direction. And that, no, that's not Black Panther's Silver Age influence. Black Panther is the Silver Age influence. In time, you will represent to your nation what the Black Panther represents to Wakanda. And that is a good thing.